Welcome back to this series of tutorials by FlingOS. In this tutorial we will be looking at the PC boot process, the BIOS, bootloaders and our first look at some real code. Last time we looked at fundamental computer architecture and how lines of code translate into instructions which the processor can understand, and I briefly explained that the BIOS is the first code loaded when the processor switches on. Let's start from the beginning to make sure we really understand what is happening. We'll start from the processor being switched off. With the computer switched off there is no power in the system, except for one component. That one component is the system clock, which is powered by a small battery on the motherboard and keeps track of the real world time. This component, however, is not really relevant to what we're looking at. I've mentioned it only for completeness. When you press the power button, a variety of things happen, but the main upshot is that the processor powers on and starts trying to execute. Remember, when a processor is switched on, it must always have some instructions to execute. Very few instructions are pre-built into hardware. There are very good reasons for this, the main one being software can be engineered, changed and updated much more easily later on than hardware can be. All instructions come from some form of storage. Storage built onto specific hardware is often referred to as firmware, as it's designed specifically for that hardware. Other instructions are software and come from storage mediums such as flash memory and hard disk drives. I like to point out that I've been saying instructions rather than code, thus far, to make an important distinction. When we think of code we usually think of the text we write, be that C, C sharp or any other language. When we think of instructions we should think of the machine code, the ones and zeros which the processor actually understands and executes. We must never forget that a processor does not understand code other than the instructions called machine code. C, C sharp and others must be compiled to convert that text into machine code. Going back to the main discussion then, the processor has just powered on. At this point, in PCs, the processor realises it has no instructions to execute, so loads the instructions from the BIOS ROM. The BIOS is a pre-built system that is relatively small and designed primarily to facilitate loading more machine code from other storage devices. Most commonly, these devices are the hard disk, a CD drive, a USB stick, or from across a network. Why do PCs use the BIOS? Why not something more advanced? There are two things to bear in mind when answering this. The first is that the BIOS is legacy software, and not the only option. In fact, most modern desktops and laptops use something called UEFI, often pronounced UFI, and stands for Unified Expensable Firmware Interface. A lot of UFI implementations have backwards support for operating systems which are only BIOS compatible. So PCs use the BIOS simply because of history. The second point to remember is that the BIOS is not actually that basic, despite its name. Over the years of its existence, it has become steadily more advanced, and now supports a remarkable range of options. While it is being replaced by UFI, it's not all that bad. Moving forward, we will now look at what the BIOS software does once it has been loaded by the processor. The BIOS starts by checking the basic set of hardware attached to the processor. This includes checking processor function, checking size and condition of memory, detecting video output, and detecting storage devices. Once the BIOS has verified the system is in working condition, it scans the list of available storage devices and checks them in turn for a boot section. Every operating system has a different design and loading requirements, which would be an impractical number of variations for the BIOS to support. Instead, the BIOS requires the disk to have one of two basic formats, which it can use to load something called a bootloader. For legacy reasons, the BIOS can load at most 512 bytes from the start of a storage device. So bootloaders have to fit in the first 512 bytes of storage. So the BIOS loads the bootloader. In fact, this is just the first stage bootloader. It is roughly 460 bytes in size and starts executing from the very first byte. For the BIOS to be able to detect and load the bootloader machine code, the first 512 bytes have to have a particular formatting. Most importantly, 
The last two bytes have to contain the signature value 0xAA55. That is, the last byte has to be 0xAA and the penultimate byte has to be 0x55. This is to do with the fact that BIOS expects the disk to be MBR formatted. MBR stands for Master Boot Record. For more detail on this, please refer to the MBR article in the Fling OS documentation. The first stage bootloader is in some ways more sophisticated than the BIOS, and in other ways less clever. For instance, the first stage bootloader is not, usually, capable of reading from other storage devices other than the one it is on. This is because it will use calls to the BIOS to read from storage, and the calls do not easily enable reading from other devices. However, the bootloader is cleverer than the BIOS in that it can read the partitioning system on the device. Again, this is MBR. The partitioning system will enable the primary bootloader to load the second stage bootloader, which is stored on the device. At this point, I should explain storage medium formatting in more detail. For the sake of simplicity, I will say disk to refer to any storage device, including USB sticks or otherwise. To be able to store data on a disk, we need only to write to it. But once we've stored that data, we need a way of retrieving it that guarantees consistency, and we also need a way to make sure our data isn't overwritten. Generally, we call this mechanism a file system. A file system, as you will know, splits data into files, which are stored in folders, and that system is stored on a disk. You may not be aware, however, that there can be more than one file system stored on a single disk. There are many reasons you may want to do this. For example, you may want to store two separate operating systems. This is known as dual booting. Or you may want to split the disk into an encrypted part and a non-encrypted part. This use of the word part brings us nicely onto partitions. Partitions are large sections of the disk. Partitions contain a single file system. Information about where a partition starts and ends on a disk is stored in something called a partition table. There are two primary standards for partition tables. The oldest that's still in use is, as I mentioned before, called MBR, which stands for Master Boot Record. We will look at this in more detail in a minute since it is the format we will use. The alternative and increasingly popular format is called GUID Partition Table, or GPT. This is more complex, a bit harder to set up, and often not supported by BIOS, so we won't be using it. MBR gets its name from the fact that under the MBR system, you can list up to four partitions on a disk, of which one is marked as a bootable partition. So there is a record of the partition to boot from, known as the master boot record. MBR also includes the information about the other three partitions. Note, under GPT, you can have a lot more than four partitions. So our first stage bootloader can read the MBR partition table and find the partition which is bootable. It can then read the file system from that partition and load the second stage bootloader. The second stage bootloader can be virtually any size, since the first stage bootloader can understand the file system and so can load files of any size. So the second stage bootloader is generally much larger and much more sophisticated. The second stage bootloader is generally what displays you with alternative boot options. For instance, if you put more than one operating system on the one or more storage devices. It also carries out system-wide evaluation of things like how much memory is available. This information can then be passed to the operating system when the bootloader starts execution of the operating system. To be able to pass the information, the OS and the bootloader have to be agreed on where the information will be. There are several standards for this, but the simplest is one called multiboot. Multiboot stipulates that the first two general use registers contain the multiboot signature and an address in RAM for the multiboot information structure. The multiboot info structure has a fixed format and provides the main information such as memory size. Let's review the boot sequence. The processor switches on and then loads the BIOS from the BIOS ROM. The BIOS then scans the system, finds the first stage bootloader on a device, loads it and starts executing it. The first stage bootloader then reads the device's partition system, finds the bootable partition, reads the partition's file system, and then finds the second stage bootloader 
and then finally loads and executes that. The second stage bootloader presents the user with some options, and then loads and executes the selected operating system. At this point we will start looking at how we create our first basic bootable operating system. We know we are going to need four things. A first stage bootloader, a second stage bootloader, the basic operating system itself, and a way to test all of it. Items 1 and 2 are pre-built for us. You can write your own bootloader, and there are examples online, but given how well established, capable and stable existing open source options are, it's relatively boring and pointless to write your own bootloader. The bootloader is not particularly fun to write in my experience. The pre-built first and second stage bootloaders we will use are part of the SysLinux project. Despite its name, it doesn't really have any ties to the Linux operating system, so don't become confused by this. There is existing software that will handle the first stage bootloader, and we will discuss some peculiarities later when we use a virtual machine. But the second stage bootloader we will need to download. I have provided a link in the description. What we need is ISO Linux, because, as we will see later, we will be running our operating system from a virtual disk known as an ISO file, which comes from the name of the standard used to format the file, ISO 9660. For now, we just want some basic assembler code that will act as a stub for our operating system. We will look at assembly code in more detail in future and extend our operating system to actually display something. For now, use the assembly code shown. A link is in the description. Save this as kernel.asm. Let's briefly discuss what assembly code is and what it's for. Assembly language is the lowest level human readable language that there is. There are more than one assembly languages, one for each different architecture. There are also different variants of for the same architecture, simply because different companies decided to write their own compilers. In these tutorials, we will be using the NASM variant of the x86 assembly language. Assembly code uses acronyms and minimal syntax to represent the machine code which a computer can understand. It allows us to write machine code in a human-readable way. It can be compiled fairly directly into machine code. We will look in detail at assembly code in the next tutorial. To convert assembly code into machine code, we need to compile it. To do this, we will use a freely available tool called NASM, hence why we are using the NASM variant of x86 assembly language. NASM assembly is also referred to as Intel syntax by people online and in various tools such as GCC. The two main alternatives to NASM are GAS syntax, used by the GNU project assembly compiler, and MASM syntax, which is Microsoft's version. Use the following command line to compile kernel.asm into a binary file containing the machine code. I said that NASM produces machine code output. However, this isn't the whole picture. NASM produces what is called an object file. This means that it contains the machine code along with lots of metadata. In a larger system, the metadata would allow you to combine lots of object files to produce the final executable. This process of combining machine code from lots of files is called linking. In our example, we only have one file. However, because it is an object file, it is not the raw machine code that we need, so we still have to run the linker over our object files to get the machine code. The linker also handles things like setting the load address of the executable and defining the entry point of our operating system. To handle linking our object files together, we will use a common linker program called LD which comes as part of the GNU project compiler. LD takes the ELF formatted object files and produces a binary output. The binary output is also ELF formatted, but in a different way such that it is actually the machine code in the format we need. To link the output of NASM, the object file, into the binary file, which we will use to generate the ISO file later, run the following command. Earlier I mentioned we would be using a virtual disk called an ISO file. 
We will be using a virtual disk to test our operating system, so that we can run the OS inside a virtual machine. This will save us the risk of wrecking real hardware or damaging our PC's real data. The virtual disk we will use is called an ISO file because it is formatted to the ISO 9660 format. The disk is specially generated to be bootable. There is one quirk to using a virtual disk that I should point out. Due to the way the disk is formatted, we do not need a first stage bootloader. The first stage bootloader is handled by the virtual machine for us. Instead, we simply specify which file on the virtual disk is the second stage bootloader. This can be very confusing, particularly if you want to shift from using a virtual disk to real hardware in future. What you must remember is that to boot from something like a USB stick, you need to use special software to format the USB stick. This software copies the contents of the virtual disk to the USB stick, and also installs the first stage bootloader. This is another good reason for using a standard bootloader project such as Sysinix or Grub, because most free software for creating bootable USB sticks support these bootloaders. To convert our basic OS to a bootable virtual disk, we will use a simple wrapper tool that I've written that uses Moses ISO 9660 generator library for C Sharp to create a bootable ISO file. The software can be downloaded from the link in the description. Unzip the software to a folder and run the following command. In the next video, we will extend our stub operating system code to do something useful and we will look at how to set up and use a virtual machine to test our operating system. We will also look at how to initialize the processor.